you have your Bibles, I want to ask you to turn to uh, two places, and uh, and then we'll skip around to some more after that, if, you know, if that gives you any guidance. But uh, let's look at it. Uh, I want you to turn to Isaiah 14, and then we're also going to look around at Ezekiel 28. Uh, today's message is about worship, and boy, just so fittingly, seeing God uh, show up and, and do confirm his word uh, before I get to preach it. It's like, oh, I was going to preach on this, God, and now you, you showed up and you did it <laughs> before I could even preach it. So uh, the Holy Spirit beat me to the punch, but that's all right. He did that in the book of Acts. Uh, Peter was preaching. You know, remember that story? Peter's preaching. Right in the middle of his sermon, the Holy Spirit shows up, and he even, he jumps the queue. You want to blow somebody's theology out of the water. They got filled with the Holy Spirit before they technically got saved. So throw that to your seminary professor. <laughs> so God tends to mess up our, you know, our theology and the way we think sometimes, but I'm okay with that if you are. Amen? Praise God. So we're going to talk a little bit just because this, ha this is a foundational message for this house. This house is one of the pillars in, at New Covenant is worship. We, uh, we believe in it. We protect it. We invest in it. Um, it's just a pillar of this house. And so I just want to talk a little bit, uh, break down a theology of worship to you this morning. And uh, we're going to look at uh, some, a couple of Old Testament passages that take us way, way, way back. Look at your neighbor and say, way back. It takes us way back, but I think it does provide a framework for us to understand the, the implications and the power and the position of worship. So let me just say, first of all, that when it comes to worship, I don't, I don't know what your idea of worship is and, and how it pertains to God, but um, it, it's, let me just say this. It's not like God has this great big ego where he's like, come on, like, you know, like some kind of political narcissistic ruler, come bow down and worship me feed my ego. It's, it's not like that. But even, even if it were, suffice it to say, he's already being worshipped 24 hours a day for eternity by creatures that are glorifying angels that are exalting him around the clock. Okay, so, so he already has that. He already has Worship and uh, of, of the greatest kind being lifted up and, and offered to him. And so that begs the question, well, then what are we doing? I mean, we could kind of join in with that, but I mean, good gracious. It's angels and seraphims and cherubims and creatures in heaven making noise and celebration and singing. And they're with God in heaven. They're like, they're there. So like, what is this invitation to us to worship him? Like, like, uh, am I, um, what, I mean, am I bringing, I'm bringing breadcrumbs to this party. You know, it's like, I really don't have anything to offer to this worship party that God's receiving. So why even bother with inviting me or us, mere humans, into this thing called worship? Worship is more than a, uh, playing a CD in your car or your favorite playlist in your buds. and I mean, it is that, but it's like it is so much bigger than that. Um, worship is more than what we just did. It's more than like the time before the sermon. Um, worship is everything. So let me just give you a quick definition. In the context of worshiping our, our Father, worship, worship is love expressed. In other words, there is no unexpressed worship. If you're not giving it, if you're not getting it out there, if you're not offering it up, then it's, it's really not it. It's love being expressed. Also, worship is the fulfillment of our purpose. It's why we're here. We are worshipers. Look at somebody say, you're a worshiper. We are all worshipers. Um, just look at how we live. I mean, the time that we put into things, the places we invest, the, 
our energies, our gift, our talents. We, we worship things, don't we? We worship all kinds of things. We worship our phones. We worship our children if we're not careful. We worship people. We worship fame. We worship money. We wor There's so many things. The reason for that is because we are, God made us to be worshipers. So we're given to it. Like our hearts are, are attracted and drawn to be given to something. So the real question is what or who are we worshiping? Because we're going to worship. I love the uh, Tozer quote that says, Christ came to make worshipers out of rebels. That's why Christ came. He came to make us worshipers when we were rebellious. We, we do worship. And, uh, I mean, we live in Athens. It's not fall right now. But I know we worship. When, when the dogs hit the field, you know, we lose our minds. We worship. March Madness just ended. I worship. <laughs> you know, it's like there's all, we, what I'm saying is we're, we're wired, we're given to worship things. And so we want to understand what or who we worship. So to understand something, let's go all the way back to the origins of it. And let's discover the original meaning or the intent of it. So in the Bible, there are three angels who we know have a name. There are only three, three angels that we know have a name. They're mentioned by name, and these are, consequentially, uh, they, they carry a, a rank, if you will, that's, that's called an archangel. So they have some kind of authority higher than, greater than, and different than maybe just your, your run-of-the-mill angel. There are three that have names and they have purposes. So if you're taking notes, uh, I think we'll put these on the screen. One we know of, is his name is Michael. The angel, the archangel Michael, would, will always show up in Scripture as an answer to prayer. Prayers are being offered up, and that's when we see Michael appear. The other uh, archangel is Gabriel. Gabriel comes in scripture to deliver a word from God to the earth. So whenever we see Gabriel, it's not that he's showing up in an answer to prayer, but he's, he's, he's coming with a message. He's a messenger angel and he comes. Gabriel's the one who showed up to Mary and said, you're going to conceive a son. Okay, so, so we see that these angels with the names, with the title have purpose. And then there's a third angel, Lucifer. He has a name. And he was, and we're going to read in just a minute in the Old Testament, from some of the Old Testament prophet visions, the angel in charge of worship. He was the one designated and created to lead and orchestrate heaven's worship. And so we see these three angels with three names, uh, with three purposes. And, and by the way, these three things are the most important things in, in all of God's uh, creation these are the most important things that for us in our life. Prayer, God's Word, and worship. These th three things are vital to be incorporated into our life as we grow in our walk with Christ. And so it appears that there's these three angels. They have some kind of rank. They're archangels. They have names. And they've been given charge over these three areas. Michael over prayer, Gabriel over the word, Lucifer over worship. Now, guess which angel, angel we're going to talk about for a few minutes? Lucifer. You got it. So let's read a scripture out of Ezekiel 28, 14. This is from the Old Testament seer Ezekiel. He says in 2814 about Lucifer, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God and you walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. If you will, let's bow our heads and pray and let's ask God to speak to us, the Holy Spirit to speak to us as we discover worship. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Stay and abide with us now and speak. Move into even the protected or hidden 
maybe even the forgotten recesses of our hearts and shine a warm, glorious light. Set us free and bring us revelation. Let us become all that you've intended for us to become to the glory of your son, Jesus. And we ask you that in his strong name. Amen. Let the church say amen. 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 So there are these three angels, the one Lucifer in charge of worship. Ezekiel writes, he's the anointed one who covers. He would cover the, the portals of heaven with worship. He was anointed to create music. He lived on the mountain of God in heaven, wherever that is. And that's, that's, a, that's reminiscent of David's writing. All throughout the Psalms, David would, he would write and he would say, let us go up to the mountain of God and worship. Let us go up to Zion and meet with God. And so we see this same pattern here on the earth that was uh, revealed in heaven. Let us go up to the mountain of God and worship. Now look at, uh, let's, let's flip over to Isaiah 14, verse 11 real quick. Another Old Testament prophet, seer, God gave glimpses of heaven and, and flashbacks of eternity past, and he wrote these things down that, that we now have access to. Isaiah writes, your pomp is brought down to Sheol, and it was the sound of your stringed instruments. He's talking about this archangel Lucifer, and Isaiah writes that in, 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 in Lucifer's being was stringed instruments. He had stringed instruments created into his being. Now we're going to flip back to Ezekiel 28, 13. Because Ezekiel, and these, these Old Testament prophets, are, they're like getting glimpses, not only of things in the spiritual realm, but, but, but a time in the past. So notice Isaiah said that Lucifer had in his being stringed instrument, instruments. Ezekiel in chapter 28, verse 13 the second part of the verse says, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was, pre was prepared for you on the day you were created. So think of this. So the devil is not the little red cartoon character with a fork tail and a pitchfork running around poking everybody. That's, that's not the correct imagery of, who, of what he looks like. He was this beautiful creature who had somehow had instrumentation worked into his being. He didn't have instruments. He was the instrument. Stringed instruments were, were worked into his being. Timbrels or, or tambourines or, in other words, percussion, percussive instruments, instruments that keep rhythm, the drums. They were, they were in his being, pipes. Wind instruments in his being. And so he contained, he was created to contain all that was needed for music. All that was needed for music in heaven was built into this archangel Lucifer. He was created with these three types or these three sections, if you will, of, of instrumentation that, that we now know of and use in our music creation and notice the, Ezekiel says this, if we go back a verse, another description of Lucifer, Ezekiel writes is, he says in verse 12, you were, the, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Well, that don't sound like the devil I grew up with. You know what I'm saying? So, we, we, we need to have a, 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 an accurate understanding of this archangel Lucifer, what he was that can inform us as to what he's doing now. He's de and we know he's describing Lucifer. We know this Old Testament prophet is describing Lucifer and not some other random being because there were only four beings in the garden. Uh, when he says that he was... In, in verse 13, you were in Eden, the garden of God. We know he's talking about the devil because there was only God, Adam, Eve, and the serpent, Lucifer, the snake, the manifestation of Lucifer. Speaking of Ezekiel 28, 13, let's, let's read this because this is interesting as well. He says, 
In Ezekiel 28, 13, you were in Eden, you meaning Lucifer, were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, jasper, saf ladies, am I saying this right? Sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. So, so not only did Lucifer have instrumentation and the ability, instrumentation built into him and the ability to create music, but he was also had these, this conglomeration of beautiful stones in his being, which made him beautiful. So that's his, that was this archangel Lucifer's makeup. Now let's look at his domain. Like where is he, where is he working? Where is he at? Where has he been given access to and what is he limited from? Ezekiel 28, uh, let's look at 15 and read a couple of verses. Ezekiel continuing to write about this archangel, Lucifer says, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. Okay, so this is Lucifer's fall. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. And I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. So that is the description of the fall of the one formerly known as Lucifer, the, arch, the third archangel. Pride rose up in his heart. He began to create worship directed at himself, no longer at God Almighty. He sinned. It became about himself. Man, that sounds like me. It became all about himself. How does this affect me? What can I get out of this? They should be worshiping me, not him. All that rose up in his heart. He was cast down from his position in heaven. And now the New Testament tells, gives us insight as to where this former archangel now lives and operates and has dominion. The New Testament calls this one formerly known as Lucifer, Satan, the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He's, the, he's now the God of this world. He's been, or, or uh, Paul calls him the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2.2. 2. So this is the space, if you will, the domain that he was cast down to and has been given limited power to operate in for a time. For a time, Amen. He's here for a time. He has power for a time, albeit limited power for a time. Amen. Isaiah 4, let's go back to Isaiah 14 and let's see, let's, let's kind of dive into this thing that happened in his heart and caused the fall. In Isaiah 14, 13 and 14, the other Old Testament seer prophet writes, for you have said in your heart, Again, speaking of Lucifer before the fall, you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of congregation on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. How many times did he say, I will? I will ascend, I will exalt, I will sit, I will ascend, I will be, I, 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 ego, pride, me, mine. It was the cause of his downfall, the desire to be like God. What was the first temptation he offered to mankind in the garden? If you'll eat this, disobey God, then you can be like God. The same temptation that rose in his heart was the, was the fruit that he offered to the first man. 
And so in verse 12 of Isaiah 14, Scripture tells us how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. So we, we're getting a picture of this third archangel that was in charge of the worship of heaven. He's not a little red man with a forked tail, but he's this beautiful creature that has the ability to create music in his being. He, pride rose in his heart. He sinned against God. He was cast down from the mountain of God to the domain of the earth. Now that was pre-humans. Now we humans come along. God has he created us in his image. We carry the Imago Day. However, we are severely limited. We're not flying around like angels. We're not spitting fire out of our mouth or shooting green lightning out of our fingernails. We're simply mere limited mortals whose lives are on the clock, created in the image of God Almighty. So let's talk about us. Let's talk about our makeup, our position, in light of what we've learned about Lucifer. We know the story of mankind through Abraham and the covenant, then Moses, the law was given. One thing that's interesting about the law was the Levitical priesthood and how the priests were to enter into the presence of God, the Holy of Holies, the Shekinah, the residing glory of God. In Exodus 28, verse 17, there's something that God tells the priest to do, which is interesting. I'll just call it that. It's interesting. In light of knowing what Isaiah and Ezekiel saw regarding Lucifer and how he looked, it's interesting that God would give Moses these instructions for the priesthood when they come into the presence of God. In Exodus 28, verse 17, he says, And you shall put settings of stones in the breastplate of the priest. Four rows of stones. First row shall be sardis and topaz and an emerald. Second row shall be turquoise, a sapphire and a diamond. The third row, a jacinth an agate and an amethyst. In a fourth row, a barrel, an onyx, and a jasper. And they shall be in gold settings. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it that Lucifer would have these precious, beautiful stones in his being, the worshiper of heaven? He sinned, he's cast down. God creates these frail, weak mortals, but he tells them, when you come into my presence, adorn yourselves with these precious, beautiful stones. John, later on in Revelation, gets a, he gets a, a preemptive vision of what heaven's going to look like. He sees the, he, he, he peeks into the age to come. In Revelation 21, in verse 9, John writes, as best he can, what he sees. And he says, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. That's us, the church, the global church. And God says, John, this is what they're going to look like. In verse 11, he says, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. In verse 19 of chapter 21, he says, the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third, yes, the fourth, emerald, a beautiful stone, whatever that was. The fifth, sardonyx, the sixth, sardis, seventh, chrysolite, eighth, beryl, ninth, topaz, the tenth, again, another beautiful stone, eleventh, jacinth, and twelfth. Amethyst. I just think it's so intriguing that that was Lucifer's makeup. God creates mankind, gives them a system of worship, but in that system is present yourselves kind of in the same way. Leading to, after the return of Christ, when we're in heaven worshiping God, it shows up again. The city of our God 
where the dwelling place of God is his people, when we're gathered and God is making his dwelling among us, these stones, this, this same imagery, this same look is there in the presence of God. Do y'all find that interesting? Amen. Tap your neighbor and say, that's interesting. Not only are the stones an interesting factor, but think about this. Isaiah and Ezekiel said in the, in the being of Lucifer were these, was this instrumentation. We know in an orchestra, in a music, in a music orchestra, there are three sections. We have the, the stringed instruments. That's the viola, violin, cello, those beautiful sounding instruments, guitar, piano. We have stringed instruments, we have percussion instruments, drums, cymbals, timpani, and then we also have the wind instruments, the saxophone, the trumpet, French horn, clarinet, even the oboe. (laughs) So in our modern day orchestra are three categories of instrumentation but not only is it structured that way in our orchestras but did you know that we too have that built in us God gave us stringed instruments we have vocal cords that when we talk out of our mouths emits not just some random animalistic sound but we can control the tone and the depths and the range of our vocal cords to create harmonizing sounds where the airwaves aren't vibrating against one another, but they're rolling through our ears smoothly. We can control our tone and our, and our pitch. We can control these stringed instruments, if you will, our vocal cords by singing unto the Lord and making a joyful noise. God built that into us. For a reason, for a purpose. Not only do we have a, a string instrument built into us, but we've got some percussion instruments built into us. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Clap unto the Lord. Make a joyful noise. Sing unto the Lord, all you people. Not only that, not only do we have strings, not only do we have percussion but we've got wind instruments built into our being. Let the, when, the, when our lungs, we were just singing about this, when our lungs fill up with the breath of God and we exhale that with the sound that comes through our vocal cords and we clap our hands and the, and the breath leaves our mouths and we sing a song of praise to our God. I've, I've seen... I've had the honor of, of seeing other cultures worship God, and it's so, it's, it's, it expands your mind to see other people express their praise and their worship to God. I've been in Nigeria where they clap up these, these rhythms are so complicated. I mean, I even consider myself a musician, and I can't even keep up with the rhythms that they clap out. But it's awesome. And I see them clapping out, I mean, little kids clapping out these complicated rhythms, and they're giving God glory. And I've, I've seen people in Honduras and, and just, I mean, just a broken down leaky roof house over the water. They don't have indoor plumbing. They don't have running water. They barely have electricity to run one light. And we gather around, we hold hands, and we sing with the wind instruments and the stringed instruments singing praise and honor and thanks to God when they have nothing it seems like to be thankful for. And they sing at the top of their lungs, giving God honor and praise. So what are you saying? I'm saying God cast Lucifer down. And it seems like we're the replacements. Amen. It seems like he created us to take his spot. It seems like when he said, come into my presence and put these stones as you move in, which seems like when John saw heaven, he saw those stones and he, and he set us in that position. It seems like when he created Lucifer with all that instrumentation and now here we are, just as you were doing early, you were singing your head off and making a joyful noise unto God, clapping your hands and singing praise unto God. 
it seems like God didn't miss a beat. He cast Lucifer down and he said, I know what I'll do. To get even greater glory, I won't make some strong, perfect, beautiful creature with all that built into him. Out of the dust of the earth, out of the mud, I'll scoop up a handful of it. I'll breathe into it. And these mere mortals with limited days, no supernatural powers, no n nothing from heaven on their life. They're just mere mortals created the, from the dust of the ground. I'm going to stamp my image onto them, meaning they have a choice. They're not commanded to do this. They're not forced to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to expose my love to them and I'm going to give them a choice. But when they turn to me and they worship me, it's going to be the replacement for whatever went missing when Lucifer was cast down out of, out of heaven. We are the replacements to worship in heaven. Amen? Come on and give him praise. Not only do we have what God gave us, but God gave us the, the beautiful creativity that we have. Like, we don't just worship him with what we have. We create stuff. Moses had the shofar. David built the psaltery. And, and from then on, moving forward, we built all of these instruments and all of these things that make beautiful sounds. And there is a reason for it. It's to bring honor and glory and to create worship once again in heaven that God deserves. Yes. Yes. Hebrews 2 says this. Hebrews 2 verse 5 says, It is not to angels that he subjected the world to come about which we're speaking. In other words, God didn't send his son, live as a human, die on a cross, be resurrected from the grave, ascend back into heaven to make mansions for angels. No, he's preparing a place for you and me. It's not to angels that he subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. Verse 6, but there is a place where someone has testified. That's funny. It's David in Psalm 8. And he says, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? The son of man that you even care for him. You made them a little lower than the angels. That's our position. I mean, we're pretty weak in the created order. We're made a little lower than the angels, but you have crowned him with glory and honor. And listen, you, he has put everything under our feet. Yes. He's put everything under our feet. I think this is one of the reasons worship is so powerful. We have authority. We have authority, not because of who we were, but through Jesus Christ, we mere mortals created lower than angels have authority on this earth. But here's why I think worship is, is, is powerful. When we sing the lyrics of many of the songs that we sing, and thanks be to God for the songs that we sing, they're great and they're powerful. And they express what scripture has handed to us. But when we sing those songs, I think this is true for many of us. For many of us, it's for many, the few, the, it's, it's the few moments that we ever take the authority that we've been given. And we, with our vocal cords and our breath and with our mouth, speak it out of our mouth. We sing these lyrics purposefully or not, even consciously or not, whether we mean to or we're just mouthing along with the words, we are declaring with our mouth and expressing the authority that we have. That's why worship is so powerful. We should do that in prayer. We should do that in conversation. We should let the same language that comes out of our lips in worship come out in prayer, come out in conversation. We should let that same language of authority and power and blood-bought standing before God come out of our lips all the time. But honestly, I think for most of us, it, it, one of the few times it comes out is in worship. That's why worship is so powerful is because we then begin to exercise the authority that God has given us. When we sing these songs, again, whether we mean to or not, 
We're expressing, we're declaring the authority that God has given us and we sing it and we say it. Furthermore, how insulting must it be to Lucifer who was perfect and beautiful and created for this purpose to be cast down and for you and I to take his place. Man, what a kick in the teeth. Me? What? I I just goofed up last night. Man, I had to confess this morning. Is that y'all? Even us who are prone to wonder, given to temptation, broken in sin, through the power of Jesus' blood, we can come to him in repentance, receive forgiveness, and maintain our standing before God and exalt him instead of Lucifer. How insulting that must be. Peter said it like this. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We, us, you and I are a holy nation. We're called to show forth the praises of him who's called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Thanks be to God. We see this authority exercise at different glimpses throughout Scripture. You remember when Joshua, when they, when they did that whole circling thing in the desert for so many years, and they finally got their head on straight, and Joshua said, okay, boys, let's go. First town, Jericho, let's take it. They didn't arm up. They didn't get their military strength. What did they do? They began to circle the city and worship. And through worship, the power of God fell and destroyed the city. You remember Jehoshaphat against the Moabites? God gave the the prophet a vision. He said, look, when you descend down upon Moab, don't come with armed strength. Don't come with military might. You come singing. You come through the valley with a song on your lips, a song of praise to our God. Great is the Lord. His mercy endures forever. His faithfulness has been extended to all generations. You come down the valley with that song on your lips, and the Moabites were sent running. We see this pattern over and over. Three Hebrew boys in a fiery furnace with with no way out, and they begin to lift their hands and sing praise to God, and a fourth man shows up, rescues them. They're not burnt. They don't even smell like smoke. Daniel in a lion's den, called there all night, has no future, no hope, no way out, but he worships God in in the lion's den, and he's saved the next morning. Do you see what's happening here? Do you see the authority we have and that we exercise it in worship? Paul and Silas in a prison cell, chained to a wall. But at the midnight hour, they begin to lift their hands and sing praise to God. And the prison doors break open and they're set free. Listen, there's power in our worship. There's power in our worship. You may not know how to put words to everything, but when you lift your hands, the breath comes out of your lung, the vocal cords begin to vibrate, and the Lion of Judah inside of you begins to roar. God moves. God moves. He moves when we worship. I'll close with this. In in Luke chapter 10, Jesus talked about this whole thing, but just boiled it way down to just a few words. In Luke 10, verse 18, he throws back to Lucifer's fall, and he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, which, by the way, is so awesome. Like, that's how fast, that's how long Satan's revolt lasted. You ready? Here he is. He's building up his army. He's got a third of the angels. They've got a battle plan. They're going to take over the throne. Bam, they've gone. Like that's how fast the revolt lasted. There's none who can stand against our God. He has no enemies that can stand. So Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like like lightning. It's going to happen fast. You blink, you'll miss it. He fell like lightning from heaven. Notice this next statement to his, to his followers. So, behold, I have given you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the Do you see the trade-off? Do you see the exchange? Do you see what God did? 
I cast Satan down. He was the one who was leading worshiper. But now, behold, I've given you the authority. You have authority. Yes, he's the prince of the power of the air, but you have authority in my name to cast out demons. You have authority in my name to trample on serpents and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. You have authority. Just put your hand on your chest and say, I have authority. I don't have to fear the enemy. He's under my feet. All things are under my feet. I have authority in Jesus' name. Can we stand to our feet this morning? Come on, let's just give him praise this morning. If you know you've been given authority in the blood of Jesus Christ, you know that all things are under your feet. You're no longer afraid of what he can do to you. You're not worried about him lurking in the shadows, but you know the light has come. You're free. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of the Most High. Then give him praise this morning. Come on, let's lift up a shout to God. Let's lift it up with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We declare hallelujah this morning. Hallelujah. I want to, we just sing that chorus, or that bridge one more time. So that, that, when we were just singing, come on my soul. Don't get shy, don't get quiet on me now. Come on my soul, oh don't you get shy. Come on, exercise your authority. There's a lion inside of you. Let Judah roar. Invite the very presence of God into your family, into your circumstances. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Because you got a lion inside. Worship him. He's 